This is a Crooks radiometer and a long time ago a commenter left me a comment and asked me if I could explain this and it's been a long time. It's been years I think but I finally got around to it. I used to have one of these and I think we've all seen one when you shine a light on it it turns um, and yeah they're they're a fascinating little device. The interesting thing is how complex they are to explain. It's not just the light it's what's going on inside here that makes it really interesting. So a little bit of background. It was based on some observations by chemist William Crookes that he made in 1873. He was weighing samples in a vacuum and he found out that sunlight shining on his samples changed the results. As I said, this is complex and it's still being debated. There's no answer. So at the end of this, I'm not going to have a definite answer for you. I've got a pretty good new theory on why it works and we'll go over that. But I mean, even Einstein tried twice and failed. So that's how hard this is. We're going to get a little bit geeky, especially with the last explanation, but I promise you it's not going to be too bad. A little bit of multiplication and that's it. Okay, on to the next. Some important facts that we have to keep in mind. And one of them is that there is an optimal vacuum level and that's about one Pascal or about this many PSI. Yeah, if the uh, pressure is too great, in other words, there's too much air in here, it stops turning. If it does not spin, uh, it does not spin if the vacuum is too hard. So I used to have one of these. I bought it many years ago and during one of my moves, it got cracked, air leaked into it, stopped working. Yeah, it's kind of frustrating because I couldn't even find the leak, but it's so tiny. Okay, another thing we have to keep in mind is that the veins move immediately. There's no delay. As soon as light hits this, it starts turning. And there has been studies, there have been studies that both the black and white sides sooner or later they reach the same temperature. So as light shines on here, the black side heats up. There's no insulation between these. It's a very, very thin piece of metal. One side has, I think, carbon black on it or lamp black on it. And the other side is just the metal. So very soon the two sides reach the same temperature. And these are all the things we have to look at when we're judging a theory. So the first wrong theory is what I was taught in high school. And that is that light pressure pushes this thing around. And if this were true, it would spin faster in a vacuum, but we know that in a vacuum it stops working. It would also turn the opposite direction because light would reflect more off of the silvery side and you would get more push from that. So this theory is a bust. Again, that's what I had learned in high school. So a less wrong theory is number two, and that is that light heats the dark side over here which heats the air, the air expands, pushes it against the vein and causes it to turn. So yeah, it is true that, you know, hotter molecules move faster, they have more energy, but they also collide with the new air coming in here. So what would happen is this gas cloud would grow, the warm air would grow, but it would also push out any new molecules trying to reach it. So it might move forward a little bit and then it would stop. So yeah. Also, uh, the veins move immediately. There's no time for this expansion uh, reaction to happen. And yeah, so that's another thing working against this theory. Also, we know that in time, both sides of this reach the same temperature. So you'd have the same gas cloud on both sides, the same energy levels, the same uh, pushing on both sides. And that would stop the rotation. But we know in effect, it does keep turning. Einstein's second attempt showed that the two pressures don't cancel out around the edges. So yeah, there's a little bit of uh, pressure difference. It will start leaking around the sides. And his calculations could explain why it moved, but he could not explain why it moved as fast as it actually does. So one of the current theories, and this is actually taught in a lot of universities still, is that uh, it's from Osborne Reynolds. It's a very old theory and he's, he's been gone for a long time. Uh, yeah, he theorized that thermal transpiration was the cause of the movement. And the definition of that is where molecules move from the cold end towards the hot end of a channel only because of a temperature gradient. So the temperature gradient, not because of pressure difference. It's just if you take a, uh, a tube and you put cold air on one side and hot air on the other, the cold air will naturally migrate to the hot. Not because of pressure difference, not anything else, but just because of temperature difference. Our channel is the space beyond the edge of the vein. So if we take this section right here and we magnify it, now it's, it's the whole area all the way around here, but we're gonna look at one little piece of it. 
So we have colder air and it just wants to move towards the hotter area, just like we discussed. And it's that mass leaking from one side to the other that causes this to move according to this theory. However, this takes time to heat. And as we said earlier, the veins move immediately when the light hits it. There's no time for this to happen. Also, this would stop once both sides temperatures are equal. And we know that the temperature becomes equal on both sides. So yeah, this thing has two things working against it. This theory has two things working against it. Of the current theories I've read, my favorite is Jerry Z. Liu, PhD of Stanford University. And he introduces the concept of trans impact. Now trans impact is the explosive force of a gas molecules electron cloud expanding rapidly. So it's orbital jump because it absorbs a photon. So he describes it like a kernel of popcorn popping. Yeah, you have the same kernel of popcorn, but suddenly it gets much bigger. And that's what happens over here. This photon comes in here, this electron absorbs it. It immediately jumps out to a new level. And in the case of nitrogen, that can expand the atom by a factor of seven. So it's huge. It pushes against the vein and it pushes against other molecules in the process. The trans impact energy, so the amount of bang that comes out of this is proportional to the amount of energy that it absorbs. More energy equals more pop. Also as an interesting side note that trans impact also drives Brownian motion. So when you see dust moving around in bright sunlight, some of that is also caused by trans impact. And from the standpoint of the vein, the black side is more efficient. So we'll call it, you will abbreviate that as E. It's a more efficient absorber and radiator of light. So we'll say EB for efficiency of black than the white side efficiency. So we'll call that EW for efficiency of the white side. So mathematically speaking, the efficiency of the black side is greater than the efficiency of the white side at absorbing and releasing light. Um, we're going to have a number R and that's the amount of pop we get from the uh, absorption of the photon. And P is just a, is a constant. It's a number. So if you're using a metric metric system, it'll number will look like this. If you're using standard, it'll look different. And finally, the temperature is in Kelvin. Gas molecules in contact with the vein. So we'll look over here and we've got this vein and it's all covered with gas molecules. So I'm not showing all the gas molecules in here. They're awfully thin. As we said, this is a near vacuum. So there's molecules that of nitrogen that are stuck to the vein here. And when a photon comes in here and one, uh, a photon is absorbed by the nitrogen, it expands almost immediately. Uh, as we said, the more energy absorbed, the more pop, uh, the white side, most of the energy is reflected away. doesn't have a chance to interact. And on the black side, much more of it is absorbed and re emitted, giving the nitrogen much more chance to react. So we get a lot more pops on this side. The uh, black side from the vein standpoint, the black side is a more efficient absorber. So that's the EB that we talked about. And the white is EW repeating that. So again, the black side is a more efficient absorber and re emitter than the white side. The push power is the basically equal to the efficiency of the absorption. So that's the E number. It times the pop. That's how big a pop it is. And the pop is always going to be the same because it's the same air inside here for both sides of this. That number is always going to be the same and the temperature is going to vary a little bit from one side to the other, but yeah. So uh, we're going to say P is power. E is efficiency of absorption. We've already gone through these. R is the amount of pop from the gas, the air. P is that number and T is a temperature in Kelvin to review all those. So since R is the same for both and P is the same for both, we can kind of replace those with a little cloud. And so we can see that the power is equal to the ability to absorb and re-emit times the temperature. So yeah, this equation pretty much falls out to ability to absorb and re-emit and the temperature. And we know which side can absorb and re-emit better. So if we look at this, we plug these uh, other things in, we look at it from a standpoint of the black side. The black side power is equal to the efficiency of it to be able to absorb and re-emit times those numbers that are the same for both sides times the temperature of the black side. And the power of the white is the same. Efficiency of the white side times those numbers, same numbers times the temperature on the white side. Now again, it's not going to vary by much. Um, so if the EB is say one and the EW is 0.1, 
and the temperatures are close, then we can see that there's a lot more power on the black side and it's going to rotate. There's more popping on the black side because the black side can take advantage of even the smallest difference in temperature. And remember, it's temperature to the fourth power. Okay, that's it for all the technical nerd stuff. Let's go play with this and see what we get out of it. Let's try something like an ordinary flashlight. And it's a little LED single cell flashlight. And I gotta not bump the table. And yeah, not, not doing much. Okay. Let's try laser pointer. Laser pointers are good. And hmm. Spread it out a little bit more, get it near the edge. Oh, there we go. There we go. We get a little action out of the laser pointer. There we go. Yep, shoot it out near the corner where it's got leverage. Okay, there's that. Let's retry the flashlight. See if I can do a better job of it. Closer. It's thinking about it. Not thinking very hard though. Let's try a, what do I got here? This is a 365 nanometer UV light. Let's see what it does. Hmm. Doesn't do much of nothing. Interesting. Wow, not doing anything. Okay, let's try its little brother, the 395 nanometer. Ah, look at that. The longer wavelength is probably penetrating the glass a lot better than the shorter wavelength. And this one's cooking right along. Hard to actually see the light on camera. <laughs> yeah, it's not sensitive to it. To my eye, I can see it. It looks like a bright purple spot on the on the uh, veins. Okay, wonder what else we've got. Let's see how it reacts to cold. I don't know. In theory, it should turn backwards for a little while until the glass envelope gets saturated or something to that effect. Nope, it's pretty much just hovering there. Let me try. Let me try this wrap. Make sure you can see what's going on here. It's sort of going backwards, but I'm not sure if that's just it getting bumped. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. I've read that if you put it in the freezer, 
with the door partially open. Why the door has to be partially open, I don't understand. But it'll turn backwards until it reaches a, a stable temperature, and then it will stop moving again. So, okay, I think, let's see if I can think of anything else. What I have back here, you can just barely see it, is a Wimhurst generator. And if I crank these, can you see the sparks? Let me see if I can adjust that so they're a little more visible. There we go. Now, without shocking myself, as I have done in the past, let's see what this will do to our little device here. And I also don't want to shock the camera and ruin it. Okay, we are still recording. Whoa, that's not good. I'm trashing the camera. Whoa. But it is turning. It's not making the camera happy, so I'm going to stop doing that. Okay, so we know something about static and how this operates. Let's turn on the lights I usually use for making videos. All right. One, two. I forgot I unscrewed them. And there's this one. Boom. And finally, another one, which I need to plug in. There we go. And because of these lights, we have to do our other experiments without them turned on. That's it for our look at this Crooks radiometer. It may not be useful information, but I hope you found it interesting.